Father God, as we continue our worship together, I pray for your spirit to connect with the spirit within us that you've created. Fire us up, Father. Show us our true identity, Father. Stoke our memories so we recognise what we have with you. Just pour your spirit upon your church, Father, here and throughout the world. Equip us in Jesus' name. Amen. Carol, thank you. Carry on, right to the end of the story. Okay. <laughs> when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he had him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Give her a round of applause for reading that for us. Thank you. Very well read. You may take your seats and go back where you want to go to. Who's into gardening here? Can you put your hands up? Oh, quite a few of you then, three of you. Have you noticed the amount of... Well, that, who's not into gardening here? Who's into spiders? Have you noticed the amount of spiders around these days? Yeah? Have you seen them? Yeah? Okay. If you look out there, there's one out there, and he's caught a daddy long leg. 
and he, he's, got, he's got a meal for life. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm sharing about spiders is quite simple. They create a web, an invisible web. The worst thing is going out in the garden during the night time, okay, and you're walking through freely in the garden, and then suddenly, what's that on my face? It's a spider's web. Is there a spider on me somewhere? And they're everywhere. There's, there's probably about 20 or 30 big spider uh, webs in the garden. And they're everywhere in our garden. You can't escape it. Wendy just loves watching them devour their prey. And, uh, and uh, just knitting their web around their kill. And you know, the reason why I'm sharing this story, there is a connection. There is a connection. The connection is this, okay? There are lots and lots of webs of deceit in this world, okay? And we often fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. This is a physical body, okay? Housing an immortal spirit. It's the two in combined in one. It's where the physical and the spiritual mix together on this earth and in other ways as well. And throughout our life, we are constantly being fed to feed this physical body and to do things with physical body, whether it be material, whether it be money, whatever it be. And uh, our mindset is automatically saying the best things in life are the money, are the woman, if you've got the right one, I have, uh, Wendy, uh, are the cars, the houses. Just keep on fitting it with that. Keep on going for it and you'll be fine. And we keep on getting ourselves caught in this web of deceit. You know, John Shorter shared, shared a story about uh, uh, this country in difficulty. During the hurricane season, which is still going on now, there was not one mention about what happened in South Asia in the news. 12,000 people died in the floods over there. 12,000. I know we had 83 die in a fire over here, but 12,000 people died in a flood over there. 1.2 million uh, children couldn't go to school because all the schools were closed down. In this material world we live in, we're concentrating on hurricanes which affect rich countries. The rich are looked after, the poor are downtrodden. And it's fed through everything we live for. This week, the new iPhone 8 came out. Was it this week? Was it? But we are told to buy a new phone. We are told to upgrade. We're told to do this, that, that, and the other. And we fall for it. And we get our new phone, and we're thinking, wow, that's great. That is good. I've got my new phone. It's filled that little gap for two seconds. You put it back in your pocket, I want a new phone again. We are fed with lies that this is the way forward. In this story, we have three characters, a few more characters as well, but three major characters. We have two sons and we have a father. The younger son has been thinking, I don't know for how long, the grass is much greener over there. If I can get my inheritance now, which is not the in thing to do, I will have everything I need to enjoy my life. Does it sound familiar? How often do you hear about people um, thinking about that hope with that lottery win? Or thinking about hope with uh, uh, that better job. If I had that money, if I had that wealth, everything around me would be sorted out. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not very much into Russell Brand, but he was on um, Jonathan Ross' show last week. And his words were, I've tried all the addictions 
the drugs, the wine, the drink, the women, the money. I've had it all. I've had every single thing you can think of in life. I've had many women. I've had as much as I can of this world. But I'm still running on empty. There's a gap in my life which is still not filled. I'm an advert for what you could get in this world, which is everything, and still have nothing. So this young lad gets his dosh from his father, goes off on a, his trip away. And, it, and this reminds me of something, actually. It's not the same sort of situation, but I remember six years ago, Heather went to university. She was leaving our house for a period of time, and she was going to do her own thing. And you wonder, how is she going to get on out there in that world on her own? Is she going to take the little advice mummy and daddy gave her? Is she going to do her own thing? Is she going to mess up? But one thing we did, we prayed for her. She's back home now. She's not a follower of Jesus as yet, but I believe she will be one day, hopefully. But as we leave the, work, the safe ground around us, as many kids are leaving this church now to go to university, we should be praying for these teenagers that as they leave and experience things in their own environment, they are covered by the prayer of the church. Because this is an experience of life which will feed them all sorts of things. And the things we want them to see the most is who they are in their identity in Jesus. So this young boy's gone off. He's made loads of new friends, probably. Friends, in inverted commas. And then his friends aren't around him anymore. I wonder why. The money's gone. No friends. He loses everything. Everything he dreamed of has gone away. There's difficulties in the land with famine. He gets a job. Not the best job. He's feeding pigs. He's starving. He has nothing but the food the pigs are eating to eat from. And you know, to me, this whole story is an illustration of how we in this world are starving spiritually. We are starving spiritually. And there's people around us who are living this life who think they have it all, but the spiritual body within them is not being seen because they don't believe in it. This young boy then comes to his senses thinking, well, hold on a minute. If I go back home, my father may take me back as a servant. And I'll get fed, I'll get somewhere to live possibly, and I may be okay. So he goes home. The father is there. Now, how long has that father been standing there each day, each night thinking and praying for his son? What's he doing? What's he up to? You may have got the news that he's not doing too good. But then he sees his son. 
He sees his son in the distance. What's his reaction? Now, any normal person thinking, oh, it didn't work out, did it? He's come back home, is he? Well, he's not coming back here. He can go back to where he belongs. This is a great illustration of who we are, who, what we have with God. God is a God of grace. And um, Joshua, a few weeks ago, spoke about grace. We don't deserve anything we get from God. We're just his mere creations. This son, in asking his father for his inheritance early, is basically saying to his father, you're as good as dead in my life. You're as good as dead in my life. I want the money now, and that's it. And many people live that life in this world with God. He's not even in the equation. His father was probably thinking about his son daily, lifting up prayers to God for him. And uh, the only expression of love I can smallly identify with, with how God loves us, is when I was at the two births of our, of our children. When Heather was born, when this baby came out, this overwhelming love just comes upon you for this person you've been waiting for for nine months and whatever days it was. Were you late or early? I forgot. A bit early. Eight months and uh, two weeks and a couple of hours probably. But it's overwhelming love which just comes out of nowhere for this little package of, of noise. One of those. There's an illustration there. Just like that. And you know, you just, the love is like this. The baby's asleep in the room, but what you're doing, you're just sitting there, looking at this baby, <laughs> sleeping in the room. Yeah, it's sleeping in the room. Isn't it wonderful, sleeping in the room? And you stand there watching this baby in, with awe and love, and then they become teenagers and it soon changes, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've got one over there, Liz, haven't you? But the thing about it is, it's, an, it's the only thing I can think of which gives you an expression of this love of God. And, uh, you know, we love our children, uh, even though we're not perfect, they're not perfect, but we love them. And uh, we'll do anything for them as much as we can. But God's love for us, this father's love for this son is an undeserving love which is just constant constant, constant and standing there it's just there we can't do anything to change that love we can't do anything to make it any worse, to make it any better or any, or, or, any, or any worse. It's just there. Doesn't matter how good we are, doesn't matter how bad we are, God just loves us. And you know, this uh, lad, when he was thinking what I can do, is probably thinking, if I go back, this, the best scenario in this situation is he may, be, he, may be, he may make me one of his servants. That's probably the best scenario. But that's better than what I'm doing now. When Wendy came in this morning, it's very unfortunate, this is, 
because you can't see me. She, she told me I forgot to put my contact lenses in. So everything's, I'm here. Everything's all a blur. Everything's all a blur. And you know, each of us in this room need to make a decision at some point in our lives. To come to this illustration of a father who is God in this situation, or, or not to come to God. So you are either willing to stay in the, with the pigs and uh, enjoy that life there, or you come to God. But one thing is, is this. God's grace is this. He sends his son Jesus to die for us. And when we come to Jesus, he gives us his spirit to help us live that life he wants us to live. And it's like this. When we come to Jesus, it's like this. Like when, when he puts her contact lenses on, she sees her handsome husband. <laughs> Don't laugh, Wendy. Yeah. And she can see the TV screen and things like that around her. I mean, it's big enough. Things that are seen. There's clarity around her. She can see the sharpness of the tree. She can see the things in, like in HD. When we come to Jesus, we see life how it is. Things are clear. Things are sharper. It's like something's been taken off your eyes and your ears and your whole being. Your senses have been stoked up. This boy makes his decision. His father is there. What does his father do? The father's blown away with love. He embraces the son. Probably can't even let go of this son. He's back. He's back. He's been away, but he's back. The son is probably dirty and messy and essence of his life he just lived all around him, the odour and everything else. His father clothes him, gives him a ring, gives him new sandals. And says to him, welcome back, son. You're forgiven. You are here with me now as a son. And then the celebrations begin. This son realised what he had originally was much more than what he thought he had. And in life, we are very similar. We think we can live this life, this short, short life, on our own. But we've been created for one purpose, to live this life totally in partnership with God. Who's seen this um, program on BBC Two, The Human Body? You not? No one's seen it, Wendy. If you want something to give you evidence of the Creator in this world, which would be good to use in evangelism, watch this program. It just goes through the detail of how we come about and how we are, and all the different cells just makes up. And when I watched that, I thinking, you know what? If people can't see there's a God by just that illustration of how this body is made up, they're missing out on something. And you know, in this world, we're trying to prolong the life we have. We want to be down here longer and longer and longer and longer. If we sort out these stem cells, you may be able to add another 20 years to what we're going to live anyway. And you know, the greatest lie is, 
is, you know, the greatest life is the one to come. We can experience it now, but the greatest life is the one to come. So let's enjoy this life, but let's be the people of God God's called us to be and bridge the gap with people around us who need to hear the story of what Jesus has done for us. Now while his party's going on, the other son's thinking, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What is, go- what is going on here? It's not my birthday, there's a party going on. Why, why is there a party going on? Your son's back, your brother's back. Your little b- brother's back. And guess what, your dad's sorted him out a party. So why are the waves going on? This brother's got really angry. What's going on, Dad? What is going on? He's deserted you and you've just let him back in again. And you know, is there much difference between the two sons, really? I mean, one's gone away, but one doesn't seem to realise what he's had all along while living in that household. And you know, we can come here, we can come here to church or have this sort of spiritual life and be comfortable in who we are and what we do here. But do you realise what your identity is in Jesus Christ? The young boy didn't know that. The older brother doesn't seem to know that either. Now, the whole key of this story, to me, is your identity with God, of who each of you, you are in God. That each of you have been created in a certain way, different to each other, to be that being of God you're meant to be for him. And this older brother didn't realise that he had the richness of the household amongst him throughout his time there. He had the food, he had the the drinks, he had everything he needed there all the time. And his son comes back, his brother comes back, just to enjoy it once again. It's our responsibility, church, to bridge the gap. Because there's many people out there, by the, word, by, by the way, the word prodigal, this, is, this, is, this parable is obviously called the prodigal son, or one of the words for it, means wasteful life, wasteful, wasteful, wasteful living. And there's many people out in this world who are living that type of lifestyle because they know no better. But we in this room do know better. And we are to be people who are to direct people and say to them, look, I know the love of God. This is what the love of God's done for me. We need to bridge the gap. We need to bridge the gap between where people are and God. That's what we've been created for. I was in the the drive-thru going to McDonald's the other day, about two weeks ago. And I was going through the drive-thru. God said to me, you need to speak to the person you've got to pay. You've got to tell her to remind her of her identity of who she is in Christ while she's serving people uh, at the till. So I stopped her. I never met her before. I go, you're a Christian, aren't you? And she goes, how did you know that? Because someone told me. And uh, I said to him, I want you to remember who you are in God while you are here in McDonald's. Because you are here for more than us serving food. You're here to be an identity of people and show them where they are in God. And uh, the tears came out of her eyes. I got my burger, I was happy, and I was gone. (laughs) But the thing about it is, is wherever we are, we are to be the essence of God, because that's who we are in our identity of God, to bring that essence wherever we are with people around us. Because like this son, there are people who have been caught up in this web of thinking this is what life's all about. But you have the answer here, church, of what life's all about. And that life's all about 
that person of Jesus. That through that person of Jesus, we can enter into God's grace and have that relationship with God and be embraced by God. You have the answer. So let's bridge the gap. Let's stand, church. Which one of the brothers do you identify with? Maybe none of them. Where you are with God the Father is moment in time. I believe there's an the essence of both those brothers in all of us. That battle of wanting more from the world, which is um, constantly fighting that spiritual relationship we have with God. We are to be part of this world. We are to enjoy the things of this world, which God allows us to have. But let's remember, everything we are, everything we have in this world has been a, a loan from us, from God. The houses, the jobs, everything, it's a loan. God wants to use everything of us in the places he's placed us in. Father God, as we continue to um, look at you, help us to remember who we are in you, Father. Help us to remember that there's nothing we can do which, is, which uh, makes us change how you love us. One of the webs of lies is, are oh, you sinned again? He's not going to love you, is he? He loves you. He loves you. Let's pour your spirit upon us now, Jesus. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.